Hello everyone, ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome one and all to the R1 DevCraft release webinar. My name is Burke Holland and I'd like to tip my virtual hat this morning to all of our global audiences. This is my first ever DevCraft webinar and I'm excited to be part of it if you can't tell. If you've ever tuned into a Kindle UI webinar before, then you may have seen me. Uh, you may have seen me on a few NativeScript webinars as well if you've been to any of those, but this is my very first time on a specifically .NET webinar, and it's simply wonderful to be here with you this morning, evening, or even in the middle of the night for some of you. Now, before we get going in full swing here, let's cover some of the basics. This is a webinar, and the internet is sometimes a sketchy place. And if you've got issues with your stream, drop into the Q&A panel. We've got some great support people standing by and, and with nothing else to do but to help you have the best possible experience. So don't hesitate to drop in there and let them know if you're having issues. Additionally, sometimes someone on your network decides to uh, host a Quake LAN party in the middle of your webinar and you get buffered into oblivion. Or you get a video stream that has an aspect ratio of about four pixels by four pixels. And that's really frustrating but it's not out of the ordinary. And that's why we put this whole recording up on YouTube in high def, where you can watch it a couple hours after the webinar is over. And you can even skip over the boring parts if John Bristow's smooth voice begins to sing you to sleep. Next, let's talk about some of the important stuff, prizes. We love prizes, who doesn't love prizes? Today, we're gonna be giving away an Amazon Echo. I have one of these in my kitchen and I love it. If you don't have an Echo, you're missing out on what I consider to be the best innovation since the Phillips head screwdriver. Honestly, seriously, it is that good. If you've registered for the webinar, then you're automatically entered to win one of these here today. We're also going to be giving away an Xbox One S 2 terabyte model. This is a serious gaming machine. And if you win this, if you win this, you have the opportunity to log on and destroy me in Titanfall. I am honestly the worst Titanfall player of all time, and I wear that designation as a badge of honor. I do. And now to win this, you got to have the best question for us today. So use the hashtag AskTaleric on Twitter and ask away. Nothing is off limits, so give us your best shot, and we'll give you our best answer. We'll pick the best question asked using the AskTaleric hashtag, and you'll be the winner of this amazing Xbox setup. Now, with all that out of the way, let's get right to the meat. It's 2017, a new year, and you've got New Year's resolutions, no doubt, at least one. Would you like to know what the number one New Year's resolution was for 2016, the number one? According to an article published by Money.com, it was to enjoy life to the fullest. That's it. Not make a billion dollars, not get in the best shape of my life, enjoy life to the fullest. I love this sentiment because it's so simple, and yet for some reason it's difficult to do. While we can't help you enjoy all of your life to the fullest, we are definitely on a never-ending mission to help you enjoy it as a developer in 2017. And today we have a fantastic lineup of examples, demos, new widgets, controls, and new features in the release across the entire DevCraft product line, as well as some exciting announcements that you'll hear here today. Now here's how it's gonna break down for you. First up is Ed Charbonneau, who's gonna cover everything that's new in the world of the web platform. Next, Sam Basu is gonna level with us on the whole mobile side, covering all of the new goodness in UI for Xamarin. And then Mr. John Bristow is here, batting cleanup to give you the skinny on the desktop side. I've got a few quick notes and announcements for you before we get to these great demos. Now, first off, we have a very special announcement that we're gonna be making very soon. On February 15th, we're gonna have a special live event with Microsoft. This is a result of our 15 years of work with .NET and our partnership with Microsoft. Now, if you're interested in learning more about this announcement, and you are, trust me, you are, you can sign up at teleric.com slash ms event. And you're probably gonna to wanna to do that today. Now, 2015 was the last version of Visual Studio. So guess what? It's time for a new one. We're on to Visual Studio 2017. It's lighter, it's faster, it's better than ever before. Now we've been building extensions for Visual Studio for a long time and we've built some of the highest rated and most downloaded extensions in the history of Visual Studio, no kidding. So it shouldn't surprise you to hear that DevCraft is ready for Visual Studio 2017. Our extensions for Kindo UI, ASP.NET MVC, ASP.NET Ajax, WPF, WinForms, all of this works with Visual Studio 2017 today. Visual Studio is always improving and we want you to be able to move to the latest and greatest version. That's important to you, so it's important to us and you can make that move to 2017 today. 
2016 also brought a brand new and honestly quite different version of .NET. And of course we're talking about Core and specifically ASP.NET Core. .NET is cross-platform now, and the new ASP.NET platform is lighter and better than ever, giving you the best of what the web platform has to offer while running wherever you need it to run. What a time to be alive! If you weren't already aware, Telerik now has full support for ASP.NET Core. We are, as far as we know, the only ones who have this. Considering that a full .NET Core release is looming, quite possibly in May, now is a great time to get familiar with Core and all of the doors that it opens, not just to you as a developer, but to your infrastructure as well. You can check that out by visiting telerik.com slash UI for ASP.NET Core. Meanwhile, in JavaScript land, we've been really hard at work rewriting our Kindo UI web controls for Angular 2, or rather, just Angular now, it's just Angular. After working for many months and a few calls with Angular team at Google, we have shipped our release candidate for Angular. This is not just jQuery widgets wrapped with Angular. These are pure Angular components. That means that you can use ahead of time compilation, binding, tree shaking, all of the great speed and productivity improvements that come with Angular now, and they just work with Kindo UI for Angular. The release candidate means that these components are stable, they can be used in production, and they are fully supported. You can grab that today from NPM and also check out telerik.com slash kendo dash angular dash UI for simple instructions on how to get Kindo UI for Angular and how to get started with it and with Angular too. If you've been putting off learning Angular, now is the time to get up to speed. And you finally got a world-class component library to help you build what we believe will be the next generation of web applications. Stay tuned on this because we're shipping big updates for Kindle UI for Angular all the time. It's a constant release schedule, and we have a full 1.0 release coming in May. Now, those are all my special announcements. Enough talking from me. I want to turn it over to Ed Charbonneau, developer advocate and all-around top-notch human being, here to fill you in on what's new for web developers. Ed, take it away. There is nothing like being introduced by the one and only great Burke Holland. Thanks, Burke. Now we're going to talk about Kendo UI for Angular. Kendo UI for Angular is a complete rewrite of our popular Kendo UI widgets, except this time we're using Angular 2 components and we've done it all from scratch. We're happy to announce that Kendo UI for Angular is in release candidate. So what does this mean for you? It means that all of these great components are available today and you can get them at telerik.com slash kendo dash angular dash UI. Now today I'm gonna to show you the grid component because it's one of our most popular controls and it's got a really cool data binding feature that I wanna show you next. So let's jump over into Visual Studio Code and take a look. So here we are with an Angular 2 application. It's open in Visual Studio Code. I've already pre-configured everything through the Angular CLI and I've gone as far as to install Kendo UI for Angular Grid and its dependencies. So let's put a grid on the page and see how it works. So the first thing I need to do is go to the root module of the application and add in the dependency for the grid. Let's go do that. So here I'll have app modules open and I'll add the import to the grid module. And then I'll just copy the grid module and make sure it's being imported right here as well. Let's save that. Now I wanna to go to my app component and we'll see what's been scaffolded out there by the Angular CLI. You can see I have a basic component. Right now it has a title that says app works. What I'm gonna do is replace that app title with some product data. And I'm going to import this product data up at the top here. Product data and it's coming from products. If I look at my project, I've already preloaded this um, static class here with some products. And this is just gonna be my data set that I'm gonna bind to the grid. So back to the component, let's go ahead and set up a field for that. So I need to go down to my app component and add that field in there. So I have a private field called grid data and it's just binding to those products. Now, I need to go to my view or my app component template and add in the Kendo grid. So I'll add the grid here. And for the data property on the grid, I'm just going to point to 
the field that's in app component TS here, this grid data, which is pulling in my products. Now I'll save all of these and we'll fire this up in the browser. And you'll notice that I didn't write any other code here. It should pull in all of the grid columns just by referencing the data that is in here. So I'll get all of the grid columns for each one of these properties on the object. Let's give that a shot. And just like magic, my Kendo UI grid is bound to that data set and it's already created all of the columns for me. And you can see it's just pulled everything right out of the object that I gave it and bound it to the data grid. Now, there are a few things that aren't quite perfect, like the product name here doesn't have a space in it. And I have a category column here with some objects bound to it. So let's go back into the template and refine it just a bit. It doesn't take much to configure this thing and make it perfect. Back in Visual Studio Code, I'm in my component template again. And this time I'm going to come over to the Kendo Grid component tag, open it up, and paste in some extra code here. Now this is a code that is going to configure my columns. You can see I have the field IDs up here. And I've also got the ability to name these columns as well. So I can customize all of the column information as much as I'd like. I can even go as far as to put some templates in. So let's go ahead and define a new template. I'll paste that below here. And you can see I have a Kendo grid column again. Inside this one, I'm going to put a template. And what I want to do is render a checkbox if that data comes back is discontinued. So I'm going to save this and that should automatically refresh in my browser. So let's go over and yep, it's loading right up and there it is. How amazing does that look for just a single line of TypeScript code and some component markup? And there are nearly 20 controls in the release candidate. I wish I had time to show you them all today, but I don't. I've got limited time on the webinar. So if you want to see some more demos, we just did a webinar last week about Kendo UI for Angular, and you can find it on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash Telerik. Go there, check it out. You'll see a lot more demos. Just because we've been hard at work on Kendo UI for Angular doesn't mean we've slowed down at all on Kendo UI for jQuery. We have lots of great things shipping in this release, like support for jQuery 3. We've also started to ship Kendo UI for jQuery through the private Progress NPM registry. Improvements have been made to support Angular 1.4 and up, and we've added a united font icon that's replaced all of the bitmap icons in all widgets. Next, let's talk about improvements to our most popular Kendo UI control, the grid. In the 2017 R1 release, we've added a new minimum resizable property. With this property, you can control the user's ability to collapse columns on a per column basis. Also new in the grid is the initial sort direction property. This property allows us to set the sort direction of a column for the first time a user tries to sort a column. This is especially helpful in situations where the most logical way to analyze data is in a descending order. Great user experiences are created by anticipating the user's needs and reducing the number of interactions they need to get a task done. Next, I want to talk about one of my favorite products, Telerik UI for ASP.NET MVC. With Telerik UI for ASP.NET MVC, you get all of the power of Kendo UI, plus amazing additional features like new project templates, and scaffolding. In this release, we've updated our new project wizard for a better getting started experience. You get a file new project experience that gives you an ASP.NET MVC application that's bootstrap enabled. And all of the Kendo UI widgets that you'll find in the application are already pre-themed with Bootstrap, so everything matches. When you click File New Telerik ASP.NET MVC Project, we also include pre-configured menu, panel bar, tree view, and tab strip widgets so you can see how those work in ASP.NET MVC. In this release, we've made updates to the editor widget. Now you can import and export directly from the widget UI itself. This means you can take documents that were created in Microsoft Word and open them in the editor widget 
and then export those as PDF and other document formats. While we're on the subject of Office documents, it's worth mentioning that we have new examples for the Telerik DPL on demos.telerik.com. The Telerik DPL, or Document Processing Library, is the awesome set of libraries that lets you do amazing things with Word documents. How many times at work has somebody asked you if you could create PDFs, doc files, Excel sheets straight from code? Or how about converting from one file type to another? Well, you can do all that with the Document Processing Library. Let's navigate over to demos.telerik.com real quick so I can show you where to find some of these great demos. I'm going to scroll down and look underneath Editors, and you'll find the new examples for the Document Processing Library here. And also, over on the right-hand side, we have a new stock history dashboard. This is a really cool sample application that mashes up some of our favorite controls. In here, you'll find the tab strip and a lot of our charts and graphs all put together to show you the stock trends for the big tech companies like Google, Apple, and Amazon. All the code is right here in the browser, or you can download those as part of the Telerik control panel or from your Telerik account. Next, I want to talk to you about one of my favorite CSS development tools, SAS. In this release, we've included a beta version of our SAS-based default theme. I'm going to jump over to Visual Studio and show you a quick demo. Let's open up Visual Studio and look at an ASP.NET Core application that's using Kendo UI in the brand new default theme. In this project, I've added a package.json file. That gives me the ability to load packages from NPM. In the package.json file, I've added a dependency for the Kendo default theme. This will bring the default theme into my project, which you can see under the Dependencies node, and then NPM, you'll see I have the Kendo default theme added here. Next, I've created a SAS file, and the SAS file will import the SAS code from that NPM directory. I just need to point it to the all SAS file that's pulled in from NPM, and SAS will do the rest. So let's run the application and take a look at what we have. Here you can see we have the ASP.NET Core application up and running, and I have some widgets on the page. Uh, I have a menu up top. I've got several buttons and a grid that I can select rows from. Notice the default pink color that comes with the Kendo UI default theme. Let's write a little SAS code to change that color. And when we change this color, it'll be changed globally throughout all the widgets. This is the great part about having SAS as a development tool. So back into Visual Studio, let's go ahead and add an accent color. The accent color is going to override any of the accent color variables that are set in the default theme. So I'm going to save this. And notice I've set my accent color to a nice Kendo orange color there. If we go back to the application and refresh, now we have a nice orange color on all of our widgets. If I select rows, you can see the row color has changed. Even the buttons inside of the filters have changed and calendar controls. Any control that has the variable of accent will pick up that, that variable color. Let's go ahead and change this one more time. Let's pick a nice uh, blue color. Let's do a progress branded blue color. We'll save that. And when I save this file, Visual Studio has a plugin that is recompiling the CSS code for me. And then all I have to do is come back and refresh my page. And there it is. All of the colors have changed to blue now. So if I open up a drop down and a calendar, you can see all of the selected items are blue and all the selected rows turn blue. And this is an easy way to rebrand an application or customize it to fit your needs. My time on this webinar is running out, but before I go, I want to show you the future of .NET development with Telerik UI for ASP.NET Core. 
UI for ASP.NET Core features everything from Kendo UI with added wizards, scaffolding, HTML helpers, and even some brand new tag helpers. UI for ASP.NET Core is compatible with development and deployment on Mac, Linux, Windows, and even Docker. And it's available now. That's right. We're the first to support ASP.NET Core with a fully featured product release that you can install today. And when you install UI for ASP.NET Core, you get these awesome tag helpers and we're adding more in each release. Just like this release, we have two more, the responsive panel and the splitter. And the splitter is what I'm going to show you next. Let's jump over to Visual Studio. So I've got a fun project that I'm working on that's using the splitter tag helpers. And I want to show you how those work in ASP.NET Core. So I've got quite a bit of code on the page here, but don't worry, I'm going to explain everything and how it works. So let's fire this up in the browser and see what I have so far. If I jump over to the browser, you can see I have a three pane window here. I've got HTML, CSS, and a live preview. And you'll notice I have a splitter already here that divides this up so I can have my HTML, JavaScript, and preview panes. And I've got controls on here that allow me to collapse and expand. The splitter control is great for this. So let's add the final pane in here. I want a CSS pane right in the center. So back over to Visual Studio, I'm going to show you how to add this in. Now, I could come right in the middle here between the pane that has my HTML and the pane that has my JavaScript and add this new splitter control. When I open up a brace, you'll see I automatically get IntelliSense that's scoped to a Kendo splitter pane. So how is it doing that? Well, if I come outside of a Kendo splitter, up into just generic HTML area, I could write anything here. I could do just HTML, or I could call up some other Kendo UI tag helpers. Let's do that. Notice when I hit dash, I get IntelliSense for all of the tag helpers that are available in UI for ASP.NET Core. So I have things like splitters and uploads and dialog boxes. So in here, I could start a new splitter. But once I'm inside a splitter, I've scoped to a splitter pane. So let's add that in. Let's do a Kendo splitter pane. And let's say collapsible is true. Notice I get nice intelli IntelliSense for this as I type. And when I close a tag, it automatically closes. So there I've added a splitter pane. And this splitter pane can have HTML inside of it. So I'm just going to go ahead and add that final bit of HTML code there. Now that will do it. I can go back to my application that's running and that should be there. But before I go, I just want to show a little bit more of this rich IntelliSense. Up at the top here, let's just recreate this opening tag that started this uh, Kendo splitter pane. So let's do Kendo again, and we'll do dash splitter. And notice I get all of the nice IntelliSense here. I can name this, I can set the orientation, and it'll jump right over into C Sharp as I type this out. So when I type splitter orientation, you'll see that IntelliSense pop up. I can set this to vertical or horizontal. And just like the tag below, we're all set. So that would kick off a brand new Kendo UI splitter. So let's go back to the application and refresh the page. And there's our CSS box nice and big in the middle. We could resize this to our liking using the handlebars here or use the collapse buttons. Now, right now this doesn't really do anything. I can tab between these. Notice the live preview is not doing anything. Let's have a little fun. It's not going to be super robust, but it'll work. Let's go down to scripts and let's add in the code to make this a live editor. That's right, a live JavaScript, JS fiddle type of editor. So we'll just add a script tag right here. And I'll paste in my jQuery code right here. And just this three lines of jQuery will do everything we need just for this demo. Let's go back and refresh our page. 
and let's have a little fun with our new editor that we just created. So I'm going to paste in a, an image tag here. That's my gravatar. Let's have a little fun with that. Let's, uh, let's set a border radius of 50 so it's a nice circle. And we'll test out our JavaScript pane and do a little resize. So there, there we have a nice little JS Fiddle type application built with Kendo splitter panes in ASP.NET Core. If you'd like to try any of the tools that I showed you today, go to Telerik.com slash devcraft and download a 30-day free trial and check it out. If you're already a customer, make sure you log into your account and download the latest updates. That's all the time I have today, but the webinar continues with mobile development with the talented Sam Basu. All right, well, thank you, Ed. So that was all things modern web. And sure, it's ubiquitous, but guess what else is exciting? Mobile apps. Now, Burke already did introduce all of us, but once again, I am Sam Basu and at SAMIDIP. That is my Twitter handle. Please feel free to reach out to me at any time. All right, so let us talk mobility. It is 2017 and everybody has a mobile strategy. Maybe you're building native apps, maybe it's hybrid apps, or maybe it's somewhere in the middle. But the bottom line is you have lots of users on different platforms, and how do you support them all? Let's take a look at what we can do for you in the Telerik DevCraft R1 release. Now, as mobility has evolved over the last several years, I think you'll find that our messaging has been pretty consistent. It's all about choice for the developers. The technology stack that you use to build your mobile app really depends upon your skills, the audience that you're trying to serve, and the type of app that you want to build. And we really do not want to hold your hands one way or the other. Maybe you want to build a truly native app in iOS, Android, or Windows. Or maybe you want to go the hybrid route. Maybe you want to pick up an open source framework like NativeScript to build a truly native cross-platform application, but with web technologies. Or maybe you have your roots in .NET and you really want to use Xamarin to take your applications cross-platform. So no matter what be your technology stack, we want to make sure that we have polished and performant UI controls for all your mobile apps. Now, if you head out to Telerik.com and hit the little products drop-down menu, you'll find all of the product suites that make up the DevCraft family. And in the mobile section, you'll see what I'm talking about. We have native UI controls for Windows Phone, UWP, iOS, Android, NativeScript, and Xamarin. Now, DevCraft used to be all about .NET, but we have branched off to give you native UI controls for iOS or Android in case you were making applications in Objective-C or Java. Now, most .NET developers, however, like myself, prefer sticking to Windows or taking the Xamarin route to take our applications cross-platform. Today, I'm going to show you several new UI controls, especially for Xamarin, but understand that these are native UI controls and they're very performant on each platform. So you can find the same exact UI controls in the iOS suite or the Android suite or even with native script. It really is all about choice for mobile developers. Now, that said, let's dive into Telerik UI for Xamarin. Now, we are pretty pumped about Xamarin, and in 2017, you'll see us making huge investments to make sure you have the richest UI control suites as you're building your Xamarin applications. Now, I'm pretty sure that I don't need to sell you on the promise of Xamarin. Starting with the Microsoft acquisition and the build announcements from last year, I think Xamarin has truly democratized cross-platform mobile development for the .NET developer. You get to target iOS, Android, Mac, Windows, smartwatches, TVs, and a host of other devices using skills that you already know. Now, Xamarin is completely free and open source. So no matter what be a development platform, Windows or Mac, you get top-notch development tools and IDEs for free. So what's holding you back? Now, as you build your professional Xamarin application, what you are going to need are polished UI controls. Trust me, I have tried from scratch. It is really not worth reinventing the wheel on complex UI like charts and graphs and side drawers and list views. You really want professionally engineered UI controls that are performant and native on each platform. With Telerik UI for Xamarin, you get to target Xamarin iOS, Xamarin Android, or what I think is the best approach is Xamarin Forms, where you get to build iOS, Android, or UWP applications from a single code base. The best news is it all works exactly the same way on Windows or Mac and any editor of your choice. On Windows, you could run with Visual Studio, on Mac, you could run with Xamarin Studio or the new kid on the block that's Visual Studio for Mac. Telerik UI for Xamarin simply works the same way everywhere. Now, like I said, 2017 brings a really busy roadmap for us. We are adding lots and lots of new controls to the UI suite, including several in this release. So as you can see, we are serious about UI for Xamarin. We think Xamarin paired with the right polished UI controls is a great way for .NET developers to take their mobile apps cross-platform. 
All right, so before I go into what is exactly new in this R1 2017 release, let me rattle off a few controls in UI for Xamarin that I'm really fond of, and I use them a lot in my apps. First are the charts. We have about a dozen of these charts with different types of axes and interactions built in. These are professional data visualization UI elements that are really difficult to create from scratch. Next up is the list view, a control that I use invariably in all of my apps whenever I'm displaying a collection of things. It is loaded with features like pull to refresh, cell swiping, selections, animations, easy data virtualizations, and layouts. We have a data form control, which is perfect for mapping your POCO business object onto corresponding UI elements, be it read-only or editable. There are three commit modes and built-in validations and user feedback. Next up is one of my favorite controls, the side drawer. This is great for organizing the content of your app and it provides really easy navigation for the user. The side drawer provides completely customizable slide out effects and transitions, so you get to control the complete user experience of the app. Now finally, last but not the least one to highlight is the calendar control. This one is great for those weekly, monthly, or yearly views with multiple types of date range selections. It has localizations built in and it integrates beautifully into the calendar of the user on every mobile platform, iOS, Android, or Windows. All right, so finally, let's talk about what's new and happening in the UI for Xamarin control suite in R1 2017 release. We have several new controls to introduce, and I'll show you demos of some of these things in just a minute. But first up is an autocomplete text view. This is simply to aid the user's typing. And as the user is typing, he gets suggestions from a predefined list. It sounds very simple, but it's actually really hard to implement on your own. And the user gets to have not just one, but multiple selections from the list. There is a new radial gauge, which is one of those classic, heavily used data visualization UI component. You get to display the magnitude of a value over a circular range guided by your upper and a lower bound. And sure enough, the radial gauge is highly customizable to your needs. Now, there are a couple of different ways in which you can integrate UI for Xamarin in your existing Xamarin project, but we want to make it easier for you. There are already some Visual Studio templates, but now we're introducing some project wizards for Xamarin Studio as well as Visual Studio for Mac for an even better getting started experience. Now, the two other new things in UI for Xamarin do not actually have a UI component to them, but they are extremely useful nonetheless. First is a zip library. As mobile developers, I think we need to be very conscious of the user's bandwidth and data limitations. So if you're sending a lot of data back and forth between your app and your backend service, use the zip library to zip it up and then unarchive it on both ends. And finally, there is the spread stream processing. This is a document processing functionality that's part of several other DevCraft products. And the idea is easy data exports. If you have a certain part of your Xamarin application from which you would like to export data out, like for a report in an Excel spreadsheet, use the spread stream processing. The RAD spread stream processing exposes a very flexible API that gives you fine-tuned control over exactly how the data export works onto your Excel spreadsheets. Now, the good news is all of these new controls and functionality in UI for Xamarin works exactly the same across all IDEs, be it Visual Studio, or Xamarin Studio, or even Visual Studio for Mac. Okay, so we are still talking R1 release here, but just to kind of entice you guys with a taste of what's to come in our R2 release, you'll get several big controls as well, namely a tab view, a ratings controls, which is highly requested, a linear gauge, and much, much more. So I have rambled along for a while now, but hopefully I'm able to show you the promise of Xamarin and how serious we are with Telerik UI for Xamarin in our R1 release. There is much more to come, and it's an exciting time to be in this space. All right, so enough talk and death by PowerPoint. Let's jump into code and show you a quick demo. All right, so for my demo, I'm actually going to stick to my Mac machine here. The code that you're going to see is in C Sharp and XAML in my shared portable class library. So that really is the same everywhere. So I'm here in Xamarin Studio. Let me show you a couple of different ways in which you can first get started with Telerik UI for Xamarin. Let me uh, switch to my browser here. So this is the home page where you get started, telerik.com forward slash Xamarin UI. You could hit this big download free trial button. What that does is just downloads a trial version of the entire product suite onto your machine. So let me switch here to my uh, file explorer. You'll see that this is a trial folder that I have downloaded. It includes a lot of things, the binaries, some example apps, uh, some license and project templates and a quick start foundation guide. So now if I look into the project templates here, you will see there are a couple of VSIX files. These are Visual Studio extensions for if you're doing Visual Studio development. And then there is this impact file, which is mostly for Macs. 
So let me switch back to my uh, Xamarin Studio here. What I could do in Xamarin Studio is simply go to uh, the add-in manager and I can say go ahead and install from file and I can point uh, to my downloads directory, the trial folder, go into the project templates and grab this impact file and simply install from file. Once you do that, let me cancel out of this, it's going to show up here as an IDE extension, a new project template for Xamarin. See, now this one is lighted up and it's ready for me to go. So let me close that out. And now if I go to a new solution, if I'm starting up a new project, you get all of your uh, regular Xamarin templates. But down here, if we go into look into .NET, and now you see a Telerik Forms app. What that does is if you begin a new Xamarin Forms project with that Telerik template, you will simply get all of the Telerik bits pre-installed for you and ready to go in your project. Now this new Telerik Forms template isn't obviously the only way to get started with UI for Xamarin, but it's a really easy getting started experience. Let me uh, kind of bail out of here. The other thing I want to show is if you really want to do this manually, if I go back to my file explorer, you have all of your binaries right here for Android, iOS, UWP, uh, and Xamarin Forms. And if you go and look into uh, the documentation site, which is if you start at docs.telerik.com and go find UI for Xamarin, it lists out everything that you need to know. For each of the controls that you want to use, we have documentation that shows you exactly which DLLs you need and where you need to drop it in your iOS, Android, or Windows projects. So you could simply make sure that you have the right references to all of the Telerik bits and the right DLLs in your corresponding projects and simply go ahead and get started that way. There is actually another alternative, easier way to integrate UI for Xamarin in your projects. Let me show you that. If I go back here to my Xamarin Studio, let me actually go ahead and uh, open up a solution. I'm a bit of an aviation enthusiast and I've been building this app that showcases all of the business jets and supersonic jets. It's kind of fun. So here's a little app. Uh, it's just iOS only, but I can add an Android project to this. If I move the same solution over to Visual Studio, I can add um, uh, a UWB project to this. So what I could do here is in my Xamarin Studio, go to Preferences, find the preferences for uh, NuGet and go into Sources and actually add a new source that points to the Telerik NuGet Gallery. This is going to ask you to sign into your Telerik account the first time you use it, but it's a real nice easy way to bring in the UI for Xamarin bits. And this NuGet server works exactly the same way on Xamarin Studio or Visual Studio for Mac on a Mac or Visual Studio on Windows. So let me actually cancel out of here. Once I have that source set up, I can go into my project directory or any of my uh, solutions here, and I can add uh, a new package. Right click here and say add packages. I can pick up the, uh, make sure I point to the Telerik NuGet gallery, and I can search for Xamarin here. And you'll notice that the Telerik UI for Xamarin bits show up right here. And all I have to do is just hit add package, and it automatically just makes sure that all of my references here uh, from packages include all of the bits that I need to use in my project. So make sure you do this on your shared PCL as well as in any of the uh, platform specific projects like iOS, Android, or UWP. So once I have everything set up, I can go ahead and actually start uh, building out my app. So in my case, let me go ahead and actually run the app, uh, start without debugging. And this is going to bring up the iOS simulator here. And here you have my app running. It simply starts off with a list of all the business jets. This is actually pulling down data from uh, a cloud service. Now, in case you're liking the fluidness of this list, this particular view here is actually using the list view control that comes with UF for Xamarin. So it's loaded up on features like pull to refresh, I can do cell swipe, I can rearrange, and a whole bunch of things. Now, if I swipe here from the right, you get to see the Telerik side drawer. Remember how I mentioned it's so nice to organize and add navigation to your app? Here it is uh, in action. So let me go ahead and go to this little page called the speed check. It's a simple page, but it shows you both of the new uh, UI controls that we have in action. This is an autocomplete box and this is a radial gauge. So down here, it's asking you to pick your jet. So let me go ahead and start typing. As you can see, as I start typing, it shows me suggestions and this template can be actually customized. So let me go ahead and pick the Boeing business jet here and show you the max speed. It's a big plane, it doesn't go as quickly. Uh, these are tokens just to kind of show you that you can pick multiple ones here. So if I close that out and actually go ahead and pick something like a citation, which is a smaller plane, that should go much faster. You can see the needle here goes way up there. So this is the radial gauge in action, and that's the autocomplete box. And keep in mind, you can choose one, you can choose multiple. The templates are completely customizable, and the same goes with the radial gauge. The custom ranges, the colors, the needles, everything is customizable. 
All right, so let me show you some code here. I'm going to maybe minimize this a little bit. So this is my solution. This is my shared portable class library. That's my iOS project. So everything that I'm doing here is in my shared PCL. So it's perfectly shareable between iOS, Android, and UWP. So if you look into my views here, I have a speedview.xaml, which is just a regular XAML file. You'll notice that I have some references here up for my Telerik bits. And down here is my Telerik RAD autocomplete. It's got a couple of properties. The couple of things to note is uh, it's got a text search path used for data binding, and it's got a display mode. Right now it's tokens, which allows multiple selections, but you can just have one selection as well. Then I have a view model here, which is where I'm binding it to some sample data. So I have a JET data source, um, which has a max speed and the JET name, and I'm filling it up as a collection of objects and then binding this list in my code behind file. So you'll notice that in my code behind file, I'm simply initializing my view model and then binding the item source property of the uh, autocomplete search box to that data source. So that's all it takes. And it knows how to search through that collection of strings and find the suggestions for the user. All right, so back in my XAML file, you'll notice the next thing I have is the Telerik gauges and then the RAD radial gauge. In there, I have uh, defined my axis, I've defined my indicator, I've defined some value ranges and the gradient of colors to get my gauge going. And once the user chooses his uh, aircraft from that suggestion list, I simply grab the aircraft uh, from this tokens collection of the autocomplete box. And I grab the first one and I'm going to grab the max speed and set the speed indicator value of the radial gauge to the max speed of the jet. So that's all it takes. What I will urge you guys is to take a look at the documentation for all of these controls. So if I head back to my browser, this is the doc site. If you drill down to the controls, here you'll find the autocomplete box uh, and all the features. Notice how you can data bind and you can customize the suggestion item template. So you can make the suggestions for the user look like anyhow you want with images and stuff like that. And then if you scroll down further, you will see the gauge and the radial gauge has different features like animations. You can customize the axis, um, the indicator needles, as I was talking about, everything is customizable to your needs. So take a good look at the documentation as you're using these controls so that you can use them to the exact specs that you need for your application. So that's all I had with UI for Xamarin and the demos. Let's get back to the slides now. So moving on, the next thing I want to talk about is Telerik UI for UWP. This is our UI product suite for all things Universal Windows Platform. And we have some really, really polished controls in there. There is the ever popular data grid. There is the ubiquitous list view. There is a dozen different types of charts and graphs and gauges. There are maps and there is a lot of different types of input controls. So stop reinventing the wheel. If you're really building universal Windows platform apps, grab the Telerik UI for UWP bits and ship your apps faster. Now, I think the really cool thing about UWP apps is the fact that you can target futuristic devices like a HoloLens or a Surface Hub from a single code base and run your application on every Windows 10 device. Now for R1 2017, I don't have a whole lot of new things to report, except if you are on the cutting edge and using Visual Studio 2017 RC, we got support for you there. But for our UI for UWP suite, we have something really big cooking. I can't tell you what it is, but I can only hint that in about a week or so, watch for some announcements. It's going to be big. All right, so for my resources, I'm simply going to point you to some product pages because you can get to sample apps and documentation and everything else starting from those product pages. I will remind all of you guys one more time that mobility is not about one thing. There is no one way of doing things. Maybe you're building native apps for iOS, Android, or Windows, or maybe you're going cross-platform with Xamarin or NativeScript. But no matter what be your mobile strategy, we should have rich and performant UI controls for all your mobile apps. All right, so before I end, I guess a quick shameless plug. Uh, my good friend James Mondemagno from Microsoft hosts a channel line show called The Xamarin Show. I'm going to be on there next week, and we'll talk about building that aviation app from scratch using some real-world developer problem-solving skills and Telerik UI for Xamarin. If you're interested, check that out. So that's all from me about mobility. Hope you guys are as excited about the next generation of mobile apps in 2017 as I am. So pick your right technology stack, grab the right UI controls, and go build your next dream app. Thanks again for watching, and over to you, John, for all things desktop and reporting. Thanks, Sam. Awesome stuff. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to demonstrate the innovative features we've added to our desktop UI controls and reporting. Let's start by covering what's new in our UI controls for WPF. As some of you know, our component suite for WPF provides an extensive set of controls for building rich, beautiful desktop applications. It features over 100 controls with themes, touch support, document processing, MVVM support, and more. In the previous release of UI for WPF, we introduced the Office 2016 theme. 
This new theme makes your application look like Office 2016, giving your users a familiar styling and user experience overall. For R1 2017, we've added a touch version. This new touch-based theme provides a compelling option for building and delivering modern touch UI for your WPF apps. Moving on from themes, we've made improvements to the processing and viewing of PDF documents. Our PDF viewer is a highly performant and memory efficient control for displaying PDF documents in a WPF application. With the R1 2017 release, it now supports the ability to display forms and form fields like text, choice, and button fields. We've also added the ability to visualize digital signatures. The PDF Stream Writer provides a utility class for exporting PDF files through streams. It has great performance and a minimal memory footprint. In this release, the PDF Stream Writer has been updated to support splitting and merging of PDF documents. This provides you with greater control over the serialization of PDF documents for your WPF apps. When it comes to working with data, the Pivot Grid provides you with a control that allows your users to quickly summarize data whilst providing features like support for OLAP and KPIs, layout and totals positioning, built-in calculations, and much more. In this release of UI for WPF, we're adding the ability to get records participating in the calculation of a value in a Pivot Grid. This was a highly requested feature in our product's user voice portal. Now, most developers targeting WPF will utilize the built-in designer of Visual Studio to determine aspects like layout and control styling. In order to make your use of the designer that much more efficient, we've added smart tag support to our controls so that at design time, you can get quick access to contextual help, such as links for control-specific resources like documentation, forums, examples, etc. The goal here is to provide you with these resources where they'll likely be the most help. Moving on from tooling support to specific control updates now. Our calendar and date time picker provides flexible controls for date navigation and selection. In the R1 2017 release, these controls have been updated to support Arabic calendars, giving you better internationalization support for your WPF apps. We're also happy to announce the RTM release of the RAD Chart View 3D and the RAD Spread Streaming Processing controls. These were introduced as beta controls in the previous release, and now they're official. I invite you to check out the demos we built that highlight the capabilities of these controls. The RAD Chart View 3D is great at visualizing data in a 3D manner. It's super performant and offers a wide range of rendering options. The RAD Spread Streaming Processing Control is part of our document processing libraries that allow you to create big spreadsheet documents and export them to formats such as XSLS and CSV file formats very efficiently. Microsoft recently announced plans to retire the Bing Soap web services that RADMAP has been using internally for its providers. As a result, plenty of applications and controls relying on it will stop working. However, if you're using the RADMAP today, we've got you covered. We're extending the Bing REST map provider, relying on Bing REST services to deliver routing, location search, and even elevation data. On top of that, due to high demand, we've added an option to export the map to an image. And finally, we've added support for standard values and culture in the property grid. This functionality allows developers to set a predefined list of entries to be displayed for a certain property. Let's take a look at these updates to our WPF controls. I'll start by launching the Color Theme Generator. This is a tool that we provide for the 19 built-in themes in UI for WPF. Here, you can see the new touch-based theme we have for the Office 2016 theme. Buttons are bigger, layouts are adjusted. It's much more finger friendly than the one it's based on, which is here. Do make sure to download the color theme generator if you wanna see this in action yourself. Moving on, here I am inside Visual Studio 2017. I have an existing project open, which showcases the PDF viewer in a WPF app. Inside the designer, you'll notice that if I hover over this control, I can click on this arrow to reveal the smart tag support we've added to our controls. This is contextual help about the control that's highlighted, giving me quick access to the information I need to use it effectively. Let's launch this application. It's a simple WPF app with the PDF viewer control embedded inside. As I mentioned before, the PDF viewer now supports the ability to display forms and form fields like text, choice, and button fields. 
Clicking on this button will display a PDF document that contains a bunch of form fields. This is a sample PDF document provided by Adobe. We've also added the ability to visualize signatures. Here is a PDF document that displays the digital signature I've embedded into this document with my Apple developer ID. The PDF viewer will now visualize it along with a watermark. Looking quickly at the code for this, we support both streaming of PDF documents as well as loading directly through a URI. Here, I'm loading both PDF documents as resources from a URI string. Simply setting the document source of the PDF viewer is all that's required to make this work. Now, when it comes to producing PDF documents, the new PDF Stream Writer class can help. It provides a performant API for manipulating existing documents or generating PDF pages on the fly. In this example, I'm using the PDF Stream Writer to generate a PDF document based on a single page that I have. Here, I'm initializing the metadata and then iterating over the page many, many times to generate one document. If we run this code, the PDF document will be generated quickly and persisted to disk. This is the document that was created. Finally, I'll show you the drill down functionality we've added to the RAD pivot grid. Here I am in the samples browser that we ship. The pivot grid listed here contains a set of data. As part of this update, I can now respond to a double-click event that will allow me to drill down into the data that underpins a cell value. Jumping into Visual Studio, here you can see the event handler for the double-click event. After determining the cell that has been selected, I can then invoke the getUnderlyingData method that will allow me to drill into the cell's value. Providing this context to users will help them better understand what values are derived within the confines of the pivot grid. All right, let's switch gears now and talk about the updates we've made to the UI controls for Windows Forms. As some of you may know, we provide over 110 controls for Windows Forms, featuring thousands of built-in features like document processing, built-in themes, multi-touch support, accessibility compliance, and much more. In this release of UI for WinForms, we're introducing a new RAD data filter control. This control provides a user interface for building complex filter expressions. It works by binding to a data source and providing a filtering mechanism against it. Once it's configured, all other controls that use this data source will then be subsequently filtered. You can use it just as a UI for building expressions based on a predefined set of property descriptors, and then that can be applied to a database, UI control, or a collection with support for filtering operations. It's super powerful and will provide a rich filtering mechanism for many line of business apps that target WinForms. Much of the work that was accomplished in our UI controls for WPF has been incorporated into our controls for Windows Forms. This includes the improvements we've made to the processing and viewing of PDF documents. The RAD PDF Viewer now supports the ability to display forms and form fields like text choice and button fields. It can also visualize data signatures. We've also added support for our PDF Stream Writer to split and merge PDF documents, which is great for developers targeting Windows Forms that work heavily with them. And just like the pivot grid in our UI controls for WPF, our pivot grid for Windows Forms now supports a drill down function against data bound in a local data source provider. The RAD Textbox and RAD Textbox Control have received a couple of minor updates. In addition to various bug fixes, they now feature a clear button that can be shown when needed and clears the control's text when clicked. Just like the RAD spread streaming processing control for WPF, the WinForms control now is official. It's a component for our document processing libraries that allow you to work with large spreadsheet documents. And finally, we've added update to a number of controls to improve the overall usability from a development perspective. Most notably, we've added support for binding to nullable objects in the RAD Spin Editor, our theming alternative to the standard Windows numeric up-down control. Let's take a look at a quick demo using the new RAD Data Filter. Here's an example of the new RAD Data Filter control for Windows Forms. On the right is a grid view populated with data that's loaded from a Northwind database. On the left is the new RAD Data Filter control that's bound to the same data. 
You'll notice that the data filter is already populated with a group of expressions that are currently active on the data source. Let's add a new expression. I'll choose to filter on the freight value. Notice that the data filter picks up the column names automatically. Here, I'm interested in freight values less than 10. It's also important to notice that the data filter knows the type of column as well. You can see the result of this expression. I'm left with one row in my bound grid view as a result. The data filter will propagate changes to the underlying data, giving you the opportunity to respond in kind to bound controls. I'd like to wrap up my segment with an update on what we've been working on for reporting. We provide a complete .NET reporting solution for web, mobile, and desktop applications. It has a complete feature set, allowing you to create, view, and export rich, beautiful, and interactive reports. It's everything that a lightweight and versatile reporting solution should be. Recently, we've been working hard on many new features and improvements. Chief among these is support for Visual Studio 2017, the next version of Microsoft's IDE. This is important for developers wanting to author reports in the development environment that they're used to. We're thrilled to see the improvements being made, and we're happy to commit our support to it. We further developed the auto-generated table of contents to support a book of reports so that one aggregated contents table gets added to the beginning or the end of the report book. This allows easy orientation and navigation inside the report book for the end user, both when previewing the book in a viewer control and in the exported document. We've also extended the interactive capabilities of the report viewer controls by allowing an informational tooltip to be displayed on hover over any report item or graph and map data point. This further evolves the end user experience when previewing reports. In this release, we've also updated the report book to support report sources and enable report books authoring inside the standalone report designer. This enables power users and business users to easily create combined, comprehensive reports on their own without any coding knowledge. We've introduced built-in page number and page count functions to reset the page number and count on any page based on the data. This allows flexible page section content. We've extended paging flexibility by changing the behavior of the hidden page sections so that their space can be accommodated for the rest of the report content. This will allow report content to match on less pages and avoid any gaps. Well, that about wraps it up for me. I hope you've liked what we're building for developers targeting the desktop and reporting. Burke, back over to you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ed. Sam, thank you as well. Demos are always my favorite part of any webinar. I prefer code to slides any day, any day. I just want to take one more opportunity here to remind everyone about the live event with Microsoft coming up on February 15th. Some big announcements there. You're going to want to be there for that. You can sign up for that at telerik.com slash ms dash event. You don't want to miss it. Now, it's not too late to get your questions in on that Ask Telerik hashtag. We've been chatting with you a lot on Twitter. And if you want to be in a running for this Xbox and a chance to dominate me on Titanfall, uh, or you just want to harass us on social media, now is the chance to do that. We've covered a lot of material in today's webinar, but that's par for the course for DevCraft. The Microsoft stack is a big one, and having products that cover web, desktop, and mobile is no small feat. And we've covered just about all of the DevCraft products today, including VS 2017 support, .NET Core, Kindle UI for Angular, improvements in UI for Xamarin, WPF, WinForms, and Telerik reporting. The only thing left for you to do is to make your New Year's resolution to download DevCraft. Now you can do that by pointing your browser to telerik.com slash devcraft, or if you're already a customer, check out the Teleric control panel for the latest updates today. Now that's all from us today. We're gonna to be at Microsoft Build again this year, and if you're there, we'd love to see you. We always host a great party, and we want you to be there. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at at Teleric or at Progress for all the latest news, updates, and more. Thanks so much.